narrative is the same. I mean, we have young adults that um, primarily are, um, are involved in, in the gun crime. It's primarily affecting our communities of color. It's primarily being committed by our young African American men, unfortunately, and, and they're killing each other. Um, we, we often see are being used, uh, high capacity weapons, um, multiple rounds are being fired. Um, we had, uh, you know, two weeks ago, we had over 60 rounds fired downtown. This stuff isn't, a, and this stuff isn't just specific. Um, it affects everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, what color your skin is or, or what your socioeconomic situation is. It really, it, it, it touches all of us and it should alarm all of us. I mean, we're seeing, we're not seeing like one or two rounds fired. We're seeing you know, 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, last week, we had a couple incidents where we had over 50 rounds fired. Well, 50 rounds fired in the city. And um, every, about one in six shootings result in a fatality. The other ones result in uh, non-fatal kills. And I'm not talking about property damage. I'm talking just about shooting. And that, that really is our problem. We're pretty good at solving homicides. That, that's kind of like the, you know, that really touches a nerve with everybody. Um, we talk about, you know, just egregious cases like Knowledge Sims where we had no, no community killed. Seven year old gets killed, that didn't, that didn't shock the conscience. We didn't get any community killed. But, but by and large, when somebody is killed, um, that seems to shock the conscience a little bit more and we, we tend to get that, that tip or that lead that allows us to clear that case. Our problem is our non-fatal shootings. And the reason that's a problem is if somebody is, is gonna survive that, that one and they're gonna retaliate <coughs> and there's gonna be another shooting. And it creates a shooting cycle. Um, and that's our focus, whether it's police department, sheriff's department, um, is identifying what, what we, people we refer to as trigger pullers, prolific offenders, and, and really focusing on, on that group of offenders. And um, we, uh, we feel like that's a, that's a good strategy, but it's one, one leg of the stool. We know we've got to educate, to prevent, um, and that's where I think the community comes in and has to share responsibility in this. You know, we, uh, we live in a state that very gun friendly, a lot of guns that are accessible. Um, we talk every single meeting about locking your cars and not storing guns in your cars, and we still, every night, we have a car left unlocked and a gun is stolen. Every night, we have a gun, somebody discharged with a gun. Every night, we'll have a police officer or a deputy that'll um, get in some kind of struggle, foot chase with somebody with a gun. I mean, this happens every night without fail. In, in the seven square miles of our shot spotter um, technology, which we're, we're in one of those areas right now, um, you know, a little over halfway through this year, we've had almost a thousand rounds fired. That's a lot, that's a whole lot. But, excuse me, a thousand alerts. We've had 4,000 rounds fired, we've had a thousand Bullet doesn't discriminate. I mean, when, once that goes down range, it's hitting people, it's hitting houses, it's hitting vehicles, um, and it's a it creates this whole retaliatory cycle. So, um, I, you know, I appreciate uh, Mr. Tresvant having um, such a passion and interest in this, and, and he always has, and, and, and trying to rally, you know, rally our neighborhoods and our citizens. Sad commentary when we um, can huddle up like we are here, and, and this is the turnout that we have. Um, you know, I, th I think it's I think it's a sad commentary, but um, I appreciate you all being here, and I'm, um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have.
that, but I appreciate um, my partnership with the Sheriff's Department um, and the Solicitor's Office. Uh, we, we are very clear on what our, what our role is and what we're supposed to do, um, but we have got to have assistance from the community. You've got to trust in us and believe us. We've got to, you know, we can't just sugarcoat stuff. We've got to tell you like it is. And, Reach that trust, and we gotta earn that earn that trust back. But um, you've got a really good police department that very much cares about this community and looks like this community and is a part of this community. And um, I, you know, I hope you'll work with us to come up with a real solution. Does anybody have any questions for the chief right now? Oh uh, yeah, how you do with community policing because. Um, neighborhood we very rarely see any police come through unless somebody calls them. What neighborhood? Lincoln Park. Yeah um, you know I, I think ever since the pan one, one of the things that um, happened during the pandemic is you know everything shut down to include our community meetings and in-person meetings. Um, we saw uh, uh, after you know a lot of our civil unrest in 2020 we saw a lot of leave the profession. Uh, we struggled to reconstitute some of that staffing. Uh, so we've had to really leverage our technology in our neighborhoods. Uh, between our um, the cities invested multiple millions of dollars in upgrading our camera system. We, we benefit from that, um, especially in 29203. We have an incredible uh, amount of coverage through a really advanced camera system. And of course, our shot spotter and our license plate readers. Uh, that's a force multiplier for us. We've, uh, we constantly are moving um, uh, officers and vehicles around to make sure we have a, a, you know, a, a better presence. Uh, we try to be uh, everywhere we can be. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what takes us away from neighborhoods sometimes. Um, so our north region officers, for example, because we're, uh, we're right on the cusp of north and metro, and, and the, the, those are the two regions that's most affected. We spend 60% of our time on Elmwood. You know why? Elmwood. 60% of our time. Do you not think that there would be something better for us to do? So we also go to thousands of false alarm calls every day because people won't fix a, an alarm that keeps going off at their house or they won't train an employee not set off the hold up alarm at the business when they open it up every morning. This is every single day. So we're going though, those calls for service. Guess what? That's a car that's not in your neighborhood because they're going to a false alarm call because we have to run, you know, as they say, you've got to run every ground ball out because um, that may be a real, real alarm. Um, so we're trying to do some things that, that right now we, we call them alternative response models. So we're trying to take some things off the plates of our, of our officers. We were going to over a thousand calls for service to deal with dogs from a police department. So a couple of things we've done recently, and, and it, it's just something that you should know about, we've, we're no longer responding to private property fender benders. Uh, we've, we've always done that. That's a couple thousand calls for service a year. So you back in the, the pole at the grocery store, it was tying up a police officer when all you needed to do was um, go online and get a report for the DMV. And we're not going to dog calls anymore unless somebody's been attacked. If somebody's been attacked, we're gonna come and help. Or if animal control calls us for some assistance, we'll come and help. And then um, we just, uh, we're working with a, a third party false alarm vendor uh, that's gonna Kind of automate our system and when these false alarms occur they're going to get people are going to get noticed hey your alarm is going off this is your warning get a fix um, and uh, after so many of those alarms will start to stop coming to that too so these, these are some things that we're chipping away to address your issue ma'am so we can clear up our calls uh, to the tune of probably about 10,000 calls for service that will allow us to put some more officers in, in neighborhoods on their downtime we're trying to create some more of that downtime because you're right in a perfect world where 
answering calls for service a third of the time. We're, we're writing the reports from those calls a third of the time, and the rest of the time, in a perfect world, we're, we're sipping iced tea on a 90 degree day on your front porch. <laughs> and that's not happening right now. Yes, sir. Steve, uh, with shot spotters, um, what, is, what is your best response time on the shot spotter? Well, so our, our uh, it's, it's within minutes. Within minutes. It's very, yeah, it's very good. Um, all of our officers have smartphones. We issue those to them. They also have computers in the car. So when, a, when we get an alert, it goes straight to their car and to their phone. And it, you know, it, it gives them uh, directions directly to 45 meters of the, of the alert. Um, between us and the Sheriff's Department, you know, we're, we're on top of uh, gunfire. And, and you know, interestingly, you know, we talk about community involvement. Before we, um, you know, before we turned on the shot spotter technology, um, we weren't getting calls for about, about that gunshot. And, um, and, and how we know that is when we first turned that on, we would get an alert and we would not get a 911 call. So that, you know, you can read into that whatever you want. Um, but now every single time a police officer or a deputy shows up and we collect very important evidence from those scenes. Vince may, you know, may or may not talk about it, but I can tell you that we collect evidence from scenes that connect to cases in multiple jurisdictions in very important cases. It's what helps us clear cases. So it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, <laughs> important technology for us. A follow-up question. Um, how is the communication between the 911 operator and the, uh, the law enforcement crew? I, and the reason I ask is I experienced that. I have my folks that are and they spend a lot of time asking the questions about the person and describing their gun. I'm right. telling them, I'm going to describe a big, that's pointing big, in my right? face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm lazy. There's a Good man lady. with a gun pointing at me and several other people. Mm. I need a police officer here. Right. You know? And by the time I went through that process and they got an officer there, you know, they got the officer there in time, but the guy who threw the gun, you know, he hid the gun, really? didn't arrest him, you know. That was, that was frustrating, I, 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 as well as trauma. Yeah, I, I believe it. I'm sorry you had that experience. Um, that's, that's something we do here um, uh, more often than we would like. Um, you know, our 911 operators, they're, they're very dedicated and committed, and uh, sometimes they, changing there, uh, the, the communication <laughs> center is ultimately going to um, shift over to the Sheriff's Department in probably another 18 months. Um, we think that's a that's going to be a good model for maybe improving some of that, but um, um, any, any time that there is ever a, a misstep or shortcomings with the communications, because they don't report, they don't work for us or the Sheriff's Department, they're independent, but we want to know about it because they're, they're very thorough at following up and making sure that if, if, if it's a mistake, they fix it. But they need to know about it to fix it too, so we always need to know about that stuff. So I appreciate you asking. I want to comment on that for you too. Um, you work a lot with the sheriff. All the law enforcement. My last two minutes? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of times when they're taking that information that you're, you know, they're asking you for, it's just for a dual purpose, just to help you out. But it's also to give the officers what they're looking for when they're on the end route. Many times they've already sent the dispatch to officers to you know, head your way, but they're collecting as much information as they can so they can give that to the officers on their way to you because if they don't have that information, they pull up and the gunman's standing right there, you know, uh, and they're, yeah. they're ambushed. And I understood that. So yeah. Yeah, I understood yeah. that, but it was, it was like. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm gonna tell you something else too. Somebody's got a gun in your face. That's a long time. One minute can feel like yeah. 30 minutes, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. I've, been, I've been shot, so I mean, I understand, mm -hmm. hey, where's the ambulance at? <laughs> in, in my case, I didn't get to say where the ambulance out in the coma for the next three days. But, oh. you know, it does take a while. They do do a good job, over, you know, most of all. And as far as commu communicating, I think, like I said, um, from talking with them, most of the time they are already dispatch, you know, the officers that way. They just need to get officers as much information they can get before they get there. Okay. We're glad you're still with us. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs>
So, um, before I speak, I'm going to have two more speakers out here. We'll have one more speaker, and I'm going to speak for uh, Mr. Gibson. Uh, go here. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to have Mr. Go uh, Captain Goblin from the Sheriff's Department come up. And um, what I'm going to say why he is coming up is that, one, I thank each and every person for coming. It's so important that, you know, I have a solution for all this stuff that's going on in this community. A lot of people don't want to hear it, but it's so true. It works great. Um, for those of you that don't know, I was a Los Angeles police officer, and I worked, you know, gangs, I worked homicide, I uh, worked community, you know, worked in the community, and um, I worked also with the officer and the city council people for Compton, California. Everybody knows how bad Compton was, right? Back in the 80s and 90s, and now Compton is on, like, pristine. Really? Ever go back out there, if you just searching on the internet, mm -hmm. it's just like a mecca out there. There's no, all the gangs have stopped shooting in Compton. Um, green grass out there, which is kind of rare for Los Angeles because everything is concrete out there, concrete city. But um, there's some solutions that they gave me that I'm going to share with you tonight, and um, it's going to be very interesting. So I give it to you. <laughs> it's hard to say, but it's, I, I, I tell everybody it's Coggins with the E. The E is way too funny. But good evening, everybody. And um, again, um, like everybody else has said, I want to thank you personally for being here because it shows a lot that you took your time out to even knowing that we have a hurricane coming to be in the house tonight, especially for young people, but really for people of all different ages, uh, because we need more. Very brief. I honestly didn't even realize that I would be speaking this evening. But anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna be brief because honestly, if I were if I were to be alone, I would just be saying just like Chief Hogan said, because everything that he is seeing and dealing with in the city will it will a complete reflection of it in the county. But um, just like you know, I I don't normally quote celebrities, but I think George Clooney said it best when he said, "Peace like war." That's a short statement, but that means a lot. And it had, it's, it's, it's very impactful because peace is a, is, is a, is a full-time job. And that is our job to try to maintain the peace, but we can't do it alone. We have to have a community behind us. And from my understanding, this is what the community is about tonight. Um, I've been working gangs now for 17, 18 years here in Richmond County, and I've seen it from the beginning I can tell you that for the most part, back when I first started working games, we could have some type of handle on it because it had a structure to it. We had the older guys that were actually trying to give some guidance to the younger guys um, and keep them in line and check some type of way. What we have now is you have the older, the older guys that have nothing to do with the younger guys, and the young guys are just reckless. And these are the ones, just like Chief said, we are in a gun-friendly state, and they're getting their hands on it. It's unfortunate, but you know, the, a lot of the guys that shouldn't have their hands on the guns are getting their hands on, on, on the guns and out here committing these violent crimes. Um, so you have this, the, the, the younger guys that are, are reckless, you know, they're out here just, um, you know, committing violent crimes. We just had a deputy cop and a deputy that, get, that got shot about a week ago, um, along with his fiance inside of his house with his mall patrol car out in the drive. So that's how emboldened the community has become with the violent crime. So, you, you know, like I said, um, and, and luckily, kind of piggyback on what um, Chief was saying, the knives, picking up the shell cases, that type of evidence is so important because that is going to be key in putting those people in jail. And I can tell you that you'll hear a lot more about that here soon because we made a lot of progress in knives and picking up shell cases, cases with um, Pete Like I said, I'm not going to be long. I'm here for you. I would rather hear questions that you might have and things that you might want to hear out of this meeting. And again, I appreciate I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming. Uh, thank you, Chief. Oh, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> for, <laughs> any questions that you have for the challenge? Uh, 
Well, I kind of wrote my question for Sheriff Lott, but I'm glad it's you, because uh, 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 Captain uh, Vince Goggins and I have a history now. Uh, he came to my community meeting uh, once my neighbor had a drive-by shooting. Well, it's happened again. Um, at 3612 Baywater, they've been attacked twice now. Uh, the first time was June 7th, and now August 21st. So this was just recently. But this time, one of the bullets came through my grandmother's bedroom window and into her ceiling fan. If she would have had that ceiling fan on, she wouldn't have been dead. Uh, she had glass all over her bed. She didn't, uh, she didn't know there was glass on the bed. She got up to use the bathroom and went back to the bed. Thankfully, uh, everybody was okay. It's a miracle that uh, we were spared, and I thank God that, that nobody was hurt. But this is the second time, and they're going to get bolder. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm, my nerves are at like a DEFCON one level, but my community seems to be like this is just another day in Baywater. When I know it's not another day in Baywater, but there's a certain level of apathy. I, I think Chief talked about trust. Yeah, trust is an issue because people aren't talking. I've even tried to talk to families uh, next door, but you know, you don't get anything. But, but there, there's also a certain lack of apathy. I mean, there's a certain apathy in the community because this, you know, like all, the old Westerns, you know, when they're getting attacked, they circle the wagons. And, and the community doesn't circle the wagons anymore. And it, it's just like everybody's on their own little island. If it don't happen in my house, even though it happens right across the street from me, I got nothing to do with it. And I, I just feel like we're, we're just asking for trouble because what if they get the house wrong next time? What, what, what if the person driving the car drives the car uh, on the opposite side of the road and they shoot the house on the wrong side? I mean, I mean, these kind of they, I mean, are these people smart enough to know that they got the right out? Do they care? I mean, I, I just find it just nerve-wracking every time I hear a, a, a car come down the street at you know one o'clock in the morning now, and uh, I don't see that going away because when I talk to my council members, uh, I, I'm going to quote them. Uh, we can't write ordinance against uh, uh, people's uh, right to to bear weapons. And they just throw their hands up and say, ah, we got nothing to do here. And, and I just feel like that is pitiful. And I find myself wanting to replace all but two of my uh, 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 county council members. Because most of those people are Democrats. And as a Democrat, I'm offended that most of them feel like they ain't got no responsibility to be better leaders on this issue when we are sky high in stolen guns and irresponsible gun ownership. I mean, these are irresponsible gun owners leaving their cars and their vehicles. One of the county council members told me how he did it. Okay, that was his, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the question? I'm sorry. What was the question? I apologize. So, so uh, I apologize for that rant. Uh, I wrote it down so I would rant. And, um, but uh, I, I want to ask, I have seen no extra patrol of the Sheriff's Department in my neighborhood. This is two attacks now. And I, I feel no ease. Like my community's not doing anything. It feels like my Sheriff's Department's not doing anything. I mean, I know they're investigating, but I don't feel like they're protecting me any better. So I don't feel any safer. And I know my council's not doing anything. So what, I mean, I know there's a certain responsibility you have as a community, but I, I feel like Sheriff's Department Trump on a little bit more often. And I agree. I mean, I, and, and um, I think kind of what Chief Colbert was talking about, there is stress on manpower because I mean, everybody's getting really hurt right now. And your neighborhood is one of those neighborhoods that we rarely have any issues. And that's unfortunate. I, and I know that that doesn't bring you to speak on, on, on your concern, but I was actually told that you would have um, 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 more patrol in your, in your um, community. So I would definitely say that. that I, I would appreciate that because, because the day before the 21st, and I apologize to everybody, the 
day before our shooting, there was another drive-by shooting up the street from us. So that's three drive-by shootings in our community. And we ain't getting no way. need your help. And I think that's the reason that we're here this evening. So, um, but I, I would definitely check into that for you. Well, um, sign me up for help. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. Captain Don, yeah. you have yeah. a question? Yeah. My, my problem is with law enforcement is like when y'all when y'all see the legislature pass certain laws like No carry, you don't have to have no permit. Right. Y'all don't see nothing. Y'all sit down, let that, that, that y'all let that. Let hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm telling you what I see. I'm telling you what I see. I'm telling you what I see. And, and I, I'm telling you what I see. You sit there, you sit there, let them pass these, 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 these laws and stuff. And I'm saying, where's the police? Why ain't they saying something? Because. It ain't gonna just affect us, it's gonna affect y'all too. Y'all sitting there, they, they, they pass me these AK 47s, letting these people walk around with these AK 47s. I don't hear nothing from law enforcement. Sir, 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 I, I hate to cut you off, and I'm gonna let Chief kind of thank you. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I see. Well, what I can tell you is that we're frustrated also. And I'm going to tell you All that, of us are frustrated in exactly. law enforcement. <laughs> now, dealing now, with that. Now, that, that, that that's, there, that's amazing. That, that, that's there amazing. are no other leaders in this state other than Chief Holbrook and Sheriff Flock whenever they are trying to get something passed. Those two guys are the ones that's in front of the media bringing it to light and the, and the solicitor as well. So, so we got that um, communication and we have that support here in this county. Now, everybody has a vote. People that are voting on these laws are the people that we're putting in the office. So those right. are the ones that we need right. to start really looking at and, 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 and challenging on the decisions that they're making. So, but in a, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep that short, but I can tell you, whenever something like that happens, these guys are in front of the media. And, 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 and that's hands down. Well, I, 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 know, I know what I see. I, and, and I, I know what I see. And but, just, but, just but, to pick about, but, but also one, but, but also on, one last thing. Go, go but, um, but, but also one last thing. From my understanding, I don't think this meeting was designed to attack law enforcement. This meeting, I understand what, what it's not just what you're saying. This meeting is about how we, as a community, can come back to violence out here in the streets together. Right. So I, I, I want to make sure that we move forward with that mentality. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, I know it's funny, but we do it every day. Listen, we're frustrated all the time. Yeah, I know the shout. It's done every day. My question to you is because I work in law enforcement, not as a law enforcement officer, but I have worked in law enforcement years ago in a major city, and yeah, history how history repeats itself. This is nothing new that we're talking about. My question is this, how is law enforcement working with the city council to come up with some alternative to deter the crime? That, that's my question. I saw someone's going to answer that. Okay. I'm going to answer that real, real quick for you. Okay. And it's not about what law enforcement is doing with the city council. Yeah. I'm going to give you an answer that's going to blow your mind. It's going okay. to real well. If we get enough people. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. My question is this. Yeah, what are you doing, sir? My question is to him, why do you say this is nothing new? I, 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 that, I, I don't understand what you say it's nothing new. Okay, well, I started with the police department in their communication division in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s and the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why I say that this is, that's why I always say it's interesting yeah. how history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. This is something that just, just doesn't come, come up 
out of the blue. Right. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that when I grew up, when I grew up, but I was on the police force during the time of the cocaine era was yeah. really bad. And we all remember Lynn Bias and all of those things. And uh, it was tough on the police force then, just like it was in Gotham. about that was uh, as a child we had alternatives as opposed to gang uh, activity. There was uh, pal, everybody's pal, whatever it is, there was basketball, football, pick one. Uh, one of the things I remember now that we're talking about this when I was really, really small in elementary school, they usually left the, the elementary school usually left the lights on night where you could go, you know, play ball and all of that stuff. But those that is long since passed. And also with in terms of education, we had music programs, we had all of these programs that were alternatives in, in terms of uh, alternatives to gang activity. But for whatever reason, and there are a whole bunch of them, uh, Congress, city, state, they stopped funding those things. So there's no alternative now. The answer that I have for you is the same answer that I'm giving everybody else for the crime issue. In, yeah. in Columbia, in Houston County, mm -hmm. the same answer. Yeah. Watch this. It's going to blow you away this time. Are there any other questions? decisions made in a split second. So somebody is disrespected on social media uh, or just harsh words in person, uh, that conflict is resolved by somebody pulling a gun. Yeah. And if, if the guns are so available, and um, you know, I just don't think our young folks are processing the responsibility that comes with carrying a gun and the consequences of discharging that gun. And I, I think that's difference today from you know, 25 to 30 years ago. Um, the, the age of offenders is different. Um, quite frankly, the, the sentencing guidelines are completely different. The one thing, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, if you committed a violent crime and you got caught, or you committed a drug crime, you went to, you went to prison for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and that's changed with, with uh, you know, and that's a whole other discussion when it comes to prison reform and minimum, maximums, and all that stuff, a whole other discussion. But what we do know now, with certainty, and we, we, we were talking about this before, there is a three to five percent of our population is committing 90 percent of our violent crime. Three to five percent of our population is committing the majority of our violent crime. And statistically, one percent of the population across the whole country is committing of all crime. So what that tells us is what the law enforcement is, we need to be very, very focused on our prolific trigger pullers. These offenders. But that's where the community you know, has got to be a partner with us. What, 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 what's interesting is, you know, to listen to that you know, scenario uh, about the house being shot in guarantee you that the people that pulled the trigger don't live in that neighborhood. Nope. And that's what we see time and time again. We have we have bad actors coming into neighborhoods, historic, well-established neighborhoods come into neighborhoods and flick violence. They don't even, they're not even from that neighborhood. But we still lack cooperation. <clears throat> and and I, I, I'm going to circle back. I 
should have jumped up and said, wait a minute, that was disrespectful. I just want to tell you something. I spent the majority of the winter the legislature was in session. Uh, my butt was parked up, up there at the state capitol, and I testified in front of multiple committees about open carry, and I, and, and I, you know, I appreciate the confidence of my fellow chiefs. And law, I'm the president of the Law Enforcement Office Association here for the whole state. Felt like our efforts is what kept us from getting open here. And if we weren't up there speaking out as a collective voice for law enforcement, I guarantee you we would have people strapping and walking up and down our street. This close. This is really close. And, and, and I'll tell you something else. I've been here nine and a half years. We haven't had one piece of meaningful gun legislation passed since I've been a police chief. Not one. That goes for all of our elected officials that represent this area, all over the city, all over the city, all over our state. There hasn't been one. I'll tell you the most simplest one. All these shootings, these, I told you every night, our deputies and officers arrest somebody with a gun, illegal possession of a gun. They can arrest them 50 times. And the solicitor will tell you it's a first offense. They're never going to go to jail. We don't have we don't have one of those terms graduating in sentencing, which is simply put, first time, okay, everybody makes a mistake. Second time, penalty is a little more stiffer, right? Common sense. Third time, it's more stiffer. That's not the way it is. You can get caught in this state shoplifting a Snickers bar on the third offense and then fell it. Right, Melissa? <laughs> Still a Snickers bar, third offense is a shop third offense shoplifting is a felony and you can go to prison for 10 years. <laughs> but you can carry a gun illegally and get arrested a hundred times and it doesn't matter. Oh my God. Now you tell me that's not that's not a mess. Now I'm gonna sit down. Question not comment. Well well I, it is well it is a comment okay. if you don't mind. Keep it short. Okay. Well I just want to add about the, the legislation because it will come back up. And uh, and they were outspoken, but there wasn't enough leadership in our community to speak out against it. But uh, I was with Mom McMahon Action up there at the legislature, and they were there every day. And we need more people from the community up there uh, at the Capitol uh, protesting against uh, these gun bills. So if y'all aren't there, then they're going to pass. Uh, they're, they're really. Uh, uh, arguing about a little technical piece right now. And once the House and the Senate figure that out, it's going to pass. So if they don't see enough of us, uh, then, then that's what we're going to get. Um, so that's fine. Uh, and if I could just go on the protocol, can I jump in? Because I think what please I'm going to do, do, please do, please, please do. Just kind of jump in. Okay, we're here. Yeah, 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 those of you who don't know what a solicitor is, well, Fifth Circuit, so that's uh, all of Richland County, all of uh, uh, Kershaw County. Uh, solicitor is the DA, district attorney. In South Carolina, we call it solicitor. That, that's the only difference. Same job. We got about about 38 lawyers between the or assistant solicitors between the two counties, about 120 or so staff between the two. So just, just to kind of jump right in, I, I think when it comes to it, I step up here. There just comes a point in time when you got to draw a line in the sand and determine what you will no longer tolerate. And I mean, it seems like that's what we're talking about right now, what you will no longer tolerate. Um, I joke and I talk about communities, and I'm, I'm kind of old school in a way, so I may say things now that I'm on camera, I may say it a little differently. But <laughs> I think one of the problems of when I say our communities and when communities of color, you start looking out there and you, you see the things that keep happening over and over and over again. You know, you see the the the, uh, the adage WWJD. What would Jesus do? I think you need to change it around. WWSD. What would Shandon do? Would this be going on in Shandon? Mm -hmm. Question. Mm. Question. Why? Mm -hmm. Anybody? No. Would, it, would it would it be going on in Kings Grant? No. Would it be going on in Old Woodlands? Anybody know the answer to that? Well, why wouldn't it be going on? Yeah. The they're going to speak up. They're going to speak up. We don't like we don't like to deal with that issue. So, so that's that stands because they won't allow it. They draw a line in the sand quickly, and there's certain things that don't happen because they don't allow them to happen. 
I know that's a big thing to say. It's hard to say. Well, it's not hard to say. It's easy to say. But it, it, it's painful to say, but it's true. Well, not just only that. Oh, it's those are, no, it's, those are wealthy communities. Okay. And you we didn't tell know. me <laughs> that wealthy communities are not uh, uh, payers. Yeah, you ain't gonna take you ain't gonna you know not not I'm, and I'm not saying that you're not correct about that, but what I'm suggesting is that uh, their communities, the chief just mentioned a moment ago, um, when they were up battling all went along, the, the people showed up, people showed out, voters showed up, voters showed out, voters talked to their representatives, they talked and, and, and made it clear that this is what we want and this is why we want it. And so is it harder to get gun legislation and things like that done in South Carolina because it's mostly a red state and the Second Amendment is looked at a little bit differently in some areas of the South than, than it is in other places? Yes, but you can still show up and show out and talk about the things that are important. Talk about why it affects. I mean, you talk about mom command action. Mm -hmm. Every time there's a piece of gun legislation, and what that is, that's a group of mothers who have lost sons or daughters to gun violence. And so every time there's a situation with guns, morning, noon, night, <coughs> weekend, holiday, whatever, there is a contingency of them that are going to be there speaking out and, and telling their story. And, and, and we don't do a good job of telling our story about what's happening, when it's happening, who it's affecting, why it's affecting them. What I'm suggesting is, and I'm not throwing stones because I learned that if I point the finger, there's three that come back at me saying that I need to be doing differently. So I tell people that's why I point like that. No, I'm joking. But, but, but truth be told, it can't happen without this kind of interaction. I mean, we talk about moving forward, what we need to do is relationships. Um, if, if nothing else today, when you leave here, we have now started a relationship, a conversation. So, so you need to relate with us, converse with us. We need to have these conversations. Two, we gotta educate ourselves on what's going on. And so we see these things that are happening, we have questions about the law and why it's happening. Let's talk about the law, what it is, what it means, and why it works that way. And if you don't like it, then you've got to speak to the people who make the laws, the legislators, because on this end, on our end as a prosecutor, we can only enforce the laws that are on the books. What Chief talked about is one of the more frustrating things you'll see, we call it unlawful carrying of a pistol. And so again, when he said, you go across the street right now to one of the stores, you go over to Kimball's, you take some out of Kimball's, shot with the first offense, if it's under $1,000. You go across the street, and maybe you go around the corner and steal a Snickers, that will become a second offense, third offense, fourth offense. Or if you're driving without a license, first time, DUS one. DUS two, if you do it a second time. Driving under the third, if you do it a third time. If you have a domestic violence situation, each time that happens, it's a first, second, or third. It's a graduated offense. It's the same with DUI. If you're driving under the influence, if you get stopped the first time, convicted first time, second time, third time, each time. That doesn't exist with guns, and that's a problem. You can get zero to one year, essentially, and that rarely happens. Rarely happens with guns. So at a minimum, we got to speak out on that part of it. Like Chief said, first time it can happen anytime. You know, I, I, you know, you have a you have a gun and had it up. You, it, it wasn't in the console of the car. You had it under the seat, or you had it someplace in the car it shouldn't have been. All right, it can happen. Learn the lesson. But after the second time, third time, you know, somebody I used to work with said there's no education in the second kick of the mule. <laughs> and so if you don't, basically means you don't make the same mistake twice. And you, yep. and we're at the church. We. Surely shouldn't do it a third or fourth time. But each time we have, that's where the accountability starts. You gotta teach the lesson. And that's not a lesson that's being taught if the, if, the, if the legislation won't allow you to penalize more than that. And then for a lot of reasons, judges, and I'm not putting it on judges, but the, 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 the thought process is not to put a person in jail over a situation where they're carrying a gun and they shouldn't have, and so they get a fine. Or they get another fine. But you look and you see multiple numbers, uh, unfortunately, of people carrying guns that shouldn't Guns, or they had them in their possession, they shouldn't have. That becomes an issue. Um, another piece that we see, and Chief alluded to it as well, is you know there, there's a trust issue that we all acknowledge and we all wear every day. You know, that happens with law enforcement, that happens with prosecutors. It's a long history for a lot of reasons. But I, I've been in this position about four years, going on five years now, and you cannot find a more dedicated bunch of law enforcement that you're going to find than you will find in this room. I was a defense attorney for over 20 years, practicing around the state, state courts, federal courts. Here they do everything they can to get it right. Do we always get it right? Absolutely not. We don't, but we try. And these guys show up every time they can, and they do the best that they can. But one of the things that has to happen is, number one, there has to be a reporting when crimes happen, situations happen. 
And then the follow through from there through the investigation means at some point in time, people have to testify. And you, I can't tell you the number of cases that we have to reduce, drop, or, or, or we can't go forward with them because the people who things happen to won't testify. That literally happened in the courthouse yesterday. There's a man who had been shot. Uh, the first time it was a hung jury, meaning the jury could not come to a decision. The case comes up yesterday, the victim basically said, I was asleep with this, which he couldn't do because he wasn't doing anything wrong. Well, in so many words, he said, well, I'm, I'm not testifying, I'm not doing it, and you can't make it. And if y'all subpoenaed me, which, you, which we did, if I come back tomorrow, I'm just going to sit on the set, which means he's going to walk out and hear the person who shot him, who he knows shot him, and he's going to go to is that fear? It's, it's, it's a lot of things to it. But but what it is, is it's, it's, there's a part where the job that has to be done to get those trigger pullers and others off the street, it requires communities to come forward and to, we, 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 we got to nurture, and we do the best we can with that. But there is a fear, the old snitch of hit, hit the streets that we talked about, there's a, there's a fear, and it's turned the system upside down where we're tolerating things out of fear, whereas our belief is that we stand up and draw that line and say, you know what, if it happens here, this is what's going to happen to you. And you turn that. Because I, I can sit here and read the stats of, you know, 19 plus murder cases we've tried and people who've gotten everything from 30, you know, in the last couple of years. People are getting 30 years to life in prison, sometimes double life in prison. Oh, I can sit here and talk about that. And that matters. But the deterrent effect isn't the same until communities start to stand up and say, we're not going to do this. We are going to be partners, and that's a key word, partners with law enforcement, partners with solicitors, partners with, with what's going on, because you know, at the end of the day, what we're trying to find is a way to make Richmond County a place that we're all proud of all the time, that we're, you feel happy, or you feel comfortable walking your dog in the middle of the night if you need to. You feel comfortable with your kids going to any theater around here, you know, knowing that they're gonna be okay, and there's not gonna be some situation where fights breaking out all over the place, where people can be accountable, where we can be partners with one another. Yeah, we don't always get it right, we work at it. But the thing is, is we talk, we have a partnership, and we have to have situations where we can have honest communication, but then leave here with what are the next steps. And too often, we don't take the next steps. We well, just what talk. do people do? Like, say, if a person do want to kill y'all, they're afraid to tell somebody going to come back and really tell you. That, that's that's real. But, but, but ultimately, and, and you're right, but ultimately, though, for us to prosecute a case, 
It can't be anonymous because that'll be hearsay. So well, that's true. If, if but I, I mean, you can provide can provide some information. Yes, you can provide information. Absolutely. But but at the end of the day, in order for us to do our job, prosecute, yeah, you will have to come forward. You got to come forward. Yeah. And so that's why those conversations have to happen. Uh, and uh, and it matters. I mean, crime stoppers. I mean, TV. And you, 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 you said the same. Uh, for Kepsi. I mean, just about the number of tips you get. But at the end of the day, that gets an arrest made. But to take to take those other steps that have to happen for prosecution to be successful. Somebody's got to come forward. But, but you know, I mean, and, and that is one that when you have different avenues, but also the fact is, let's get to the point of making an arrest to that bad guy. Because if he shot him, shot somebody, probably or killed somebody, he's gonna do it again. So um, if, 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 if you're dealing with skilled veteran investigators, they know how to gather that information from you, keep you anonymous, and use other techniques and, and find other evidence to solidify that case and make that case solid enough to where that person is not even going to want to go into the court. He's going to try to take so the higher so plea that he can get. You know, so so cell phones, things like that. Exactly. There's I mean, so it's, much it's, technology it's, that these it's guys so much, use. So many other ways. Yeah. But, but when, yeah. when we respond to a crime scene when somebody's kid is dead and 200 people are standing around, but nobody yeah. wants to talk. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's yeah. throwing stones at law enforcement because yeah. we're not doing anything. Yeah. Well, we're doing, you know, we're doing all we can do. Yeah. And, 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 and a lot of times those things are solved by um, trust within the community because right. that's like my unit. I, I mean, you know, a, a gang task force and a narcotics task force, those things can survive without sources, people talking to us, building trust and communication. So we have people that's gonna call us and say, hey, this is what happened. Uh, this is who's responsible, that type of thing. And, 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 and we have built those relationships because they know that we're gonna keep them outside of their court. So there are ways of doing that um, and, and making sure that that case is a very solid case so we won't have to worry about the, 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 the threats and the snitches and all that other stuff that goes along with it. Okay, so I'm gonna suit, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give it to him. I'm gonna uh, sniff a little bit of time, and I promise you guys we're gonna get one hour. So I got five more minutes, and then we're gonna, if you're here after the five minutes, it'll be on your own accord, it'll be appreciated, and you'll learn a lot. But I wanna stick with my time frame because I mean, not me. I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to ask you guys to bring other people so we can continue the conversation so that we can not only just talk about the issues, because tonight, honestly, I didn't want to talk about the issues. Everybody knows what the issue is. I wanted to talk about solutions. Okay. So before I go further, ma'am. I just want to pick back up the young gentleman who was talking about the young people. Um, my question is, and sometimes it's the parents, it's the young kids, they have so much time on their hands. What happened to, like they were saying, back in the day when they had the summer jobs for the kids? I remember working every year as a child. They don't have this for the kids anymore. Mm -hmm. The kids just got too much time to be on their hands to just run wild, or if they had a summer job, they make their own money, and then they can buy their own stuff or whatever. They don't have to go and steal and rob people and pick people up. And I could, and then like, it's this thing called scare straight the kids. I see it on TV, but where is it at in Columbia, South Carolina? I mean, yeah, we're doing it now. Yes, but you didn't do it 17 years it's just, ago. It's, it's called something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they it's were been around for a while. So, yeah. so I tried to get everywhere in South Carolina, and it's like you got to pay, because I wanted to send my child before it got too bad. But any place I want, it was like, were they on drugs? No, he's not on drugs. I just need him scared straight for something to happen, <laughs> and then he's locked up for the rest of his life. Right. And I know Chris told that they were doing stuff at the courthouse. I come leaving on Fridays, and every they'd have, they'd have the women on one weekend and the guys on the next weekend, and they were kind of that um, 12 to 17 range. Mm -hmm. So they were doing something but since COVID. I, I can't tell you how that's worked, but I, let me speak to the other point just about the programs. When, when, I, when we first moved here when I was in high school, I graduated from Greer. When we first moved here, <laughs> uh, they had, um, as, 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 as Jeff was saying, they had basketball, they, there was summer track, there was summer tennis, there was swimming and all that, and some of it was uh, done through USC, some was done through Benedict, and there was a bus system that would get people where they needed to be, and so that was big and that died off, 
I guess, in the early, in the mid 90s, early 90s. And so I, I can't, you know, and some of it's funding. You know, we talked about the funding has died for some of those things. Some of it's been revived to, to an extent. Um, I know the Urban League does about 200 jobs or so a year for, for, for youth and they're doing that kind of thing. And different offices will have interns with, you know, to a limited extent. Our office has interns to a limited extent. We can only do a certain amount because we got between high school students, college students, and then we have issues in law students, and then you have um, records, and then so this technical stuff. You can't have people walking around if you have access to NCI, you know, police, you know, just uh, background stuff. There's certain things, but, but there, there are things out there, but this is the kind of thing, again, the communication piece is important because the relationships come, you know, get, get, you put the relationships out here, and then you can start kind of hearing I think there just needs to be a repository, a place where all the information is. So we can, you know, communities know, all right, this place is offering jobs, this place is offering jobs, and then we can talk about it. These are some programs over there. The Greenview Park's got this one. This week there's a computer camp at this spot. There's a zoo camp on this spot. And so there are things that are happening, but I don't know that all the information is in this place so people can easily get a hold of it. But there's stuff, but there needs to be more. There's, there's way more room for more to happen. I just don't see what it's over. I want to tell you guys something. So, of course, the project unit, you know, I'm an engineer now. Kind of that law enforcement, law enforcement, the state would build books, so I just did something myself to say. Um, I own a company that has really backed the project unit report. And when we talk about, again, I don't want to talk about what law enforcement can do or this is what we can do. I'm going back inside the community now. We looked for three months for the church that would house the technology school that we've been trying to launch. Here in 29203, don't you think that's needed? I could not find one church in 29203 that said, we will book your, your technology school. I had to go to the election system to get somebody to book the technology school. Let me tell you, this is not only a technology school, but I got five national companies that are ready to hire these people once they get certified mm -hmm. at, at a Salary no less than sixty thousand a year. Wow. Why is it that we can't find somebody in our own community That's to say we will host this? We have to go to a church in Lexington town, mm -hmm. you know, which makes no sense. And I'm just be flat out honest with you. We have to go to a white church in Lexington County to say that we will host you. You know. Hey, let me tell you some of the things we offer. We offer to do you all the alarm systems. That's what we're teaching. We offer to do the camera system, because that's what we're teaching. We offer to do the networking, because that's what we're teaching. And they wouldn't have to pay anybody to come in and service any of that at all. We would have all of that access control. That's the fourth thing that we would teach. We can find a church in, in Richmond County that would house, you know, support us. Now, the, we're talking about, you made the point. You get these youth out here that are making $60,000, even if they're making $50,000. You think they're going to go out in the street and start messing up? And lose their job? No. Now there are going to be some that do. Mm. That's just the way it is. Um, but I'm going to leave that one alone because that kind of got real sensitive to me because I really wanted to do something for 29203 because I went to Old Bay High School. Uh, real high school used to beat the pants off the but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> but um, seriously though, the message I want to give everybody, because like I said, two minutes after, and I'm going to do this. It's going to be really quick. It's going to be Chief was alluded to it, Byron was alluded to it, Kathy was alluded to it. The one thing that we can do as a community is act like a community. Yes. When things go wrong, we need to come together and fight those things. Yeah. Let me tell you something that I found out about criminals that go out here and shoot up your community. You know why they, and, and I guess you brought this up, they're not going to go to the white community doing it because they know that as soon as they step foot across that line, somebody's calling the police. <laughs> in these black communities, we know who, who lives in these communities. We know who don't belong in these communities. We know if we see a car that's driving around at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's if, like me, I can't sleep this morning. Call the police. That's their job. They can't do their job until we do our job as a community. We have to be the ones to step up to the plate. I understand what you're talking about with the snitches get stitches and don't want to testify and stuff like that, but let me tell you, how does that work out for us? Our communities are going down Excuse the expression, but our communities are going to hell, right? No, 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 no. I understand. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just using you as, a, as an example because you're not the only one who thinks like that. A whole lot of people think like that. You know, until we come together as a community 
and we fight together as a community, what's happening now is only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. when, people, when, when you made the statement of, you know, it's this, it's, it's cyclical, it's how it happens. Yeah. When I left Los Angeles, the gangs were at the height of their, you know, the way they were. When I came here to South Carolina, the first thing I did was went to the chief of police. I can't remember who the chief was back then, but then again, he went to jail anyway, so. <laughs> He's the one that got caught down in uh, Disneyland. He's the fake gentleman down in Disneyland. But I went to him, but that's not the funny part. I went to county council, I went to city council, and I said, look, you guys got a gang problem coming. Because one thing I learned about the gangs is that back then, you know, you had the OG, you know, old, you had, um, a little bit more control. But what the game would do is, let's say somebody gets to be a lieutenant in the game, and his parents say, oh no, you're not gonna be in the game, so he'll pick him up, take his son to Little City, Columbia. Mm -hmm. What do you think he's gonna do there? Start a game. He's gonna start a game. And this is something I try to speak out to time and time again, on deaf ears, until the game, got, game problem got really real. You know, then they want me to be a part of a gangster, which I did. But the problem is, it's the community. Not only the community, I'm gonna get personal with you. If you know that your son or daughter is out there shooting, if you know your son or daughter is out there dealing drugs, if you know your son or daughter is out there breaking in the houses, put his butt in jail. Because that's probably gonna be the safest place for him. Because you're gonna mess around, you're gonna break in the wrong person's house, and you're going to end up dead, and then you're going to be saying, why did he have to kill my son? Uh, probably because he broke into the man's house at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know? So this is more than just community. It's about family. You know? And, and we got, you know, and I tell everybody this all the time. Superman ain't coming. You know, Black Panther, God rest his soul, is dead. You know, uh, Batman, he didn't see the bat signal go up. You know? We got to fight this fight. We don't fight this fight, and we don't really pull people in on this fight that we're fighting. We're going to lose. It's going to get worse. I don't care what the police department does. I don't care what the sheriff department does. The solicitor, not that I don't care, but it doesn't matter what they do. If we don't fight this fight, it's going to get worse. And if, you, if, you, if you're serious about community, if you're serious about making a change, this is where it starts today. I think I got everybody's name and telephone number, did I not? Please. And he got me fly. I don't know. <laughs> I must like my cologne or something. Right on. But um, I'm going to be calling everybody about having another meeting, probably within the next two to three weeks. Because right now, I'm going to tell you guys something. I'm a very sensitive person. There's two things that can make me cry and really hurt my heart right off the bat. That's when a child is shot and killed, and when a police officer is shot, I shot at or being shot. Those two things really hurt, hit me real hard because I was a police officer. I still consider my blood as bleeding blue and I'm gonna protect them with everything I have. When the officer got, <laughs> got shot at up in Northeast, uh, no, Elgin, I knew then that I had to start speaking out. I had to stop just being within myself saying, hmm, that's bad, and speak out and do something. So I'm asking each one of you guys to help me to make our community better. Let me ask you something. How many city council or county council people are in this room right now? Zero. Okay, I invite every last city council, every last county council to this event. Wow. Because, because they are your representatives. They're the ones that we need to speak out to and say, when you, I think you actually, you know, when they, when they um, pass this bill, when they, yeah. do you know how you stop that kind of stuff? Chief did his part, sheriff did his part, we didn't do our part. Because you know what? When they start passing stuff that we don't like, we need to vote their butt out of there. Mm -hmm. Again, like Mr. Byron said, we need to know what's going on in our community. And maybe there needs to be a sense of point that can share what's going on. You know, like gun laws. You know, who's trying to pass these gun laws? Who's pushing them? You know, and maybe we need to start voting against them. We need to vote. Mm -hmm. We know who we're voting for. We know what we're voting for. And your help, I'm gonna try and centralize some of this information. And we're gonna start getting it out to the community all over. Um, I could go longer, but I promise to keep this down to an hour. Bailey, brother Bailey.
What's your, what's your name, man? Baby, you. Yes, Portal. Yes. Huh? Portal. Who's baby? You didn't show up? Okay, Billy, never mind. Don't worry about it. I was assuming. You know what they say about assuming. Never mind, never mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, please do. Please. Yeah, that was, that's what I was going to do before we ended anyway. But. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Trevon Ford. I'm the director for the Office of Violence Crime Prevention for the City of Columbia. So in response to one of the questions about what the city is doing, they need to get in office. Um, town of Stafford last year, Stafford this year, and so we are up and running. Uh, what I did bring with me is some of our initial literature for everybody to feel sure about the strategic objectives, the plan right now as part of the office, in addition to RAC card, and just kind of give some tips as far as that community involvement, how we're going to continue to work towards building partnerships with the community, also with all of our law enforcement partners, our government agencies, and you talked about different programs for young people, that's something we're working on with our Parks and Recreation Department, in addition to other partners, to see how we can do that. Workforce development is going to be huge, uh, helping individuals and in, in referrals for jobs, wraparound services, when you talk about when individuals are victims, a lot of times, and as a former police officer, wearing a uniform for over 10 years, I know. Sometimes you get a call of somebody being shot, you go to the call, there's nobody there, or nobody, right? Yeah. Then you get a call probably 10 minutes later from our hospital that says, hey, we just had a, someone come in who said shot this. Investigator goes there, this person forgot how to speak English all of a sudden, has no words. <laughs> it happens. One of the things we have to you know, and it's, it's a witness to that, for whatever reason, sometimes they'll talk to medical personnel and that information passed on to law enforcement. So there are other avenues that we're looking at as well as far as health-based programs, but everything is looking at violence, intervention, and, and interruption programs here within the city of Columbia. So a lot of different things that, that this office is gonna roll out soon. There will be a website that we're actually meeting about, we're supposed to tomorrow, but that may get pushed back because of everything going on in operations with the city. Um, but talking about launching the website, having a menu of resources for community groups and also other resources that folks can tap into. And again, this is in conjunction with our other city departments like the police department, like parks and recreation. Working with solid waste as far as uh, community cleanups and other events. I know there's one scheduled in about two weeks, we're gonna work to get those in here. So I have the literature here as far as contacting our office. Uh, if you'd like for our office to come out and do any type of trainings as far as violence crime prevention, do any speaking engagements, or if you're having a community event, please let us know. We're also going to schedule some community forums or open mic events to where we come out and not just talk about some of the issues because again, we know issues and some of the issues may be things that may be more recent, but also start getting some solutions together and moving forward together. Because it's not law enforcement in the community, it's one community now. One city of Columbia, one Richland County. All right, so again, I just want to take the opportunity to introduce myself. Here's some literature as far as our office and some stuff. And this is my card to follow up with me as well. Um. Big question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm technically uh, county. Uh, I'm not city. Are you still able to uh, work with us, or or is it just strictly within the city? So when it comes to when it comes to crime, crime doesn't go geographic. Right. You know, yeah. You know, <laughs> right. And as a chief and Captain Goggins said, a lot of things kind of we see where folks are coming into the city from the county and vice versa, and Lexington County, Irmo, we're not turning down partnerships when it comes to partnership because again, we're experiencing the same violent crime issues. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so again, you go one street over from here, you may be in the county versus the city, but again, the criminal doesn't know, so, oh, well, they've got these programs in the city, not the county. So we're not gonna turn down partnerships as well. So I have a question for everybody in here. I wanna show of hands of who's gonna be with me, who's gonna help fight this crime? Ready to do that. But it really doesn't matter if you raise your hand or not. I'm going to send a note to everybody in here because everybody in here is affected by crime. One way or the other, but you know, we're affected by it. Um, I wanted to share this with you real quick. And this is a gun, gun violence assessment and action plan by the City County Police Department. Did anybody want one? Yeah. This is also on their website, too. Does one of y'all want this? I just heard that. So, so if you you know, really award one night. You can also go on the website and um, there's a dashboard now that, that'll tell you where all any shooting happens in the city, what neighborhood. It tells you about the, the age 
um, of the offender, um, of the suspects, it really gives you just a snapshot of what's going on, where it's going on, and who's doing it. I'd just like to say that I'm so happy to see the city and the county working better together. Absolutely. In partnership, um, because I've been just in the city over 60 years, and during the time when I grew up, it was just city wouldn't work with the county, the county wouldn't work with the city. But I'm so happy to see them working together. Because yep. crime is everywhere. So I just like to commend you know, each one for Vince, working Vince together. Vince hugs me every time you see me. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the chief is being humble, but I tell him all the time, a lot of that changed when he came here. And yes. That's the, and that's the truth. Like, yes. You know, the relationships start to really come together. And I am so happy to see it because it, it was bad during the time when I was growing up in the city. <laughs> They did not work together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't work at all. Yeah, but we are better together. <laughs> Actually, that's what started Project Unity, yeah. was the lack of law enforcement in the black community back in 2006. Anyway, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate you guys. And um, you young guys, y'all left your numbers on? I appreciate it. I got a job for y'all. I need y'all to help me with some stuff, OK? Where, where do y'all go to school at? Okay. So we're in full-time missions. Full-time missionaries. Okay.